Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Gold. I will be starting my PhD studies in statistics at the University of Washington this coming fall. And this summer, I'm going to be working with my mentor, John Miles White, on developing a prototype for nullable arrays, which we hope will replace data arrays. I see some thumbs up. Excellent. Which we hope will replace data arrays in the provision of data structures that can handle missing values. So before getting into the design of nullable arrays, I'd just like to talk a little, about, a little bit about the shortcomings and performance woes that data arrays currently experiences. And these stem really from how get index, how, the, how indexing into a data array works. When you index into a data array, that is when you call get index D for D a data array, I an index, uh, what happens is the data array indicates through its internal mechanisms whether or not the value at that index is present or missing. And if it's present, it returns the value that's stored. And if it's not, it returns an NA, where NA is a token object of NA type. And the reason this is problematic has to do with the fact that this index method, getIndex, can return either an object of type of the type of the underlying values array, or it can return an object of NA type. And this return type ambiguity confounds Julia's type inference system and hinders its ability to provide instructions to the compiler, which can then not as readily produce machine code that is specialized on objects of the underlying type of the values array. So the end result is really that any function or instruction that engages a data array heavily via the getIndex method turns into something of a black box for Julia's type inference system and really incurs a significant performance penalty in many, in many ap areas of application. Since it's not really reasonable to discourage users from indexing into arrays, uh, we've decided, or it's been decided that a new solution is necessary. So enter nullable arrays. And the thing about nullable arrays is that they take an entirely different approach to representing missing values alongside present values. And the idea is to use the type, the parametric type nullable in order to represent both values, or both kinds of values, rather. So a nullable object is a specialized container which contains precisely either one or zero values where the latter case indicates missingness. So nullable five indicates a present value of five that, under different circumstances, might have been missing, but nullable int empty indicates a missing integer value that, under other circumstances, might have been present. And we hope that we will see some significant performance wins by representing both kinds of values with the same type, and not only that, but with a type whose type parameter also includes information about the type of the underlying values array. And there are some preliminary indications that this may very well work, which is heartening and cool. But there's some other really big questions, questions that have to do not only with performance, but also with usability. In particular, how will user-defined functions and other operators that are defined initially on non-nullable objects be able to be lifted over nullable arguments in a way that is both safe and returns sane results but also in a way that doesn't require too much work for the end user. So developing feature parity with the current data arrays implementation, modulo some refactoring, and also delving into some API design experiments for different lifting schemes is mostly what I intend to work on this summer. Thank you all, and I really look forward to meeting you all over the course of the conference. <laughs> right, so, so actually, the, the, my being here, I owe entirely to Josh Day over there, who I met at my graduate school tour earlier this spring, and upon being accepted to graduate schools, I decided I ought to learn how to program things, and I was asking around for recommendations as to which programming language I ought to learn, and Josh recommended Julia, and because I'm good at selectively accepting advice and good at selectively ignoring other advice, like, hey, maybe your first programming language ought to be 
something that's not in alpha, I stuck with it and found it really enjoyable to work with. And that was like four months ago or so, and here I am. And I've really enjoyed the welcome that I've, I've found into the Julia community, both online and right here meeting you all in person. So thank you all very much.